Welcome and thank you for standing by. This conference is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. I now I'd like to turn the call over to your speaker, uh, Jeff Hamilton. Sir, you may begin. Hi, this is Jeff Hamilton. I'm with the Commercial Service Office based in Salt Lake City, Utah. Um, many of you are currently uh, commercial service clients, and some of you are new to the commercial service. Real briefly, the commercial service has offices throughout the United States and throughout the world, and our organization helps U.S. companies to uh, sell their products and services overseas uh, through a number of different manners. Uh, so any uh, questions you may have regarding exporting, uh, please feel free to uh, let me know. You should have my contact information, and I can direct you to the right person. Uh, today, uh, apologies uh, for our difficulties with uh, the webinar last week, and so today we are uh, doing a recording of the webinar, and uh, due to um, coordinating different schedules, our Singapore speaker is unavailable, but we will have speakers from China, from Thailand, and I believe from, from Taiwan as well. So our first speaker is Greg Harris, who is a commercial counselor uh, at uh, the Commercial Service Office in Shanghai. And Greg has a wealth of experience in, in Asia, in um, China, and in Taiwan. And he will speak along with a couple of uh, commercial specialists from our office in, in Shanghai, Scott Yao and Lisa Tang, on uh, alternative energy opportunities in the, in the China market. Uh, Greg, welcome. Thank you very much for uh, joining us. And please uh, proceed with the uh, presentation. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, distinguished guest, I would like to welcome you to China, so to speak. Uh, uh, China is hot and getting hotter. I mean that literally and figuratively. Uh, China is a big market. A lot of people are talking about it. Uh, and literally, it is getting hotter. There's a lot of coal, which we'll talk about in just a minute. And uh, it's a good place to discuss alternative energy. Our uh, focus of our presentation today will be to talk about what are the opportunities for you. Some of the numbers are big, but what would the numbers be for you? Next slide, please. Uh, we can always start with a, a few amazing numbers and statistics about China. The one thing we'll need to think about is what's going to happen in China is the mass urbanization that has already occurred over the last 30 years and will occur in the next 30 years. By some estimates, we've still got several hundred million people that are still going to move to cities in the coming years. They're going to want power. They're going to want lights. They're going to want cars. They're going to want um, uh, all the... Uh, modern-day conveniences of, of uh, urban life. Uh, and to do that, we're going to see uh, um, uh, lots of construction. Half the world's construction in the next or the first 30 years of this century uh, may take place in China. These are some of the anecdotes, urban legends, what have you, but this is what they're saying here. Half the world's buildings constructed over the next 10 years. Things like this. One of the most amazing statistics I've heard is there's more floor space already in China than the U.S. and the EU combined. Um, I did want to segue into just a little bit of an offshoot, and that is green building and retrofitting. Because these green buildings will be already built or be uh, um, in construction in the very near future, um, a lot of them will use current uh, technology. So if uh, there's people in that, oh, people in the green building sector, uh, that may be the low hanging fruit of energy efficiency. Uh, retrofitting current buildings may be a way to um, uh, reduce the need for some of the current uh, based uh, energy uh, technologies. Next slide, please. Just, I'm sorry to jump in, Greg. I just want to make sure you're able to see the slides yes. flipping. Yes? Yes, I can see the slides. That's great. Uh, I hope the audience can, too. And <laughs> my next one is some general advice that I would like to give to everyone. Uh, on the previous slide, I talked. Uh, there, I didn't mention it, but I'll mention it now. China, in some ways, is a cheap, but it's very expensive to do business here in some ways. Uh, and what I mean by that is when you come here, it's a very competitive market. It's very cost and quality conscious in what they want to purchase. Uh, 
So I think you should really try to do things right. Over the years, I've learned um, uh, should really count on using professional support. I don't think you should have any um, uh, napkin business plans coming into China. I think you should have professional programs with professional support. Lawyers, accountants, consultants, um, uh, do your own uh, professional due diligence, do your own due diligence. Uh, have a really plan and a really uh, good team from China to do your market entry plan. In IPR, there's two schools of thought, basically. Um, one is you've just got to come here and do things, try, and don't worry so much about the IPR. The other is uh, if you feel that the market is ready for you, then you should take all the precautions you can. I'm even more conservative than that. I said you should take your precautions now. China's the first to file country. If you have leading edge, leading edge technologies, I would get them uh, patented and trademarked and, and such uh, as soon as possible. Uh, again, that goes back to a professional plan. Uh, there are uh, uh, disputes in China, and the percentage may be low, uh, but they seem to be uh, uh, quite big and quite, uh, um, uh, I don't want to say vicious, but there can be quite uh, a confrontational and uh, as compared to the other places in Asia I've been. Um, and uh, so I would uh, encourage you to uh, have a plan to exit and to not over, uh, over rely on the people who say I have Guanxi, which is I have relationship with somebody because people leave, people move, people change positions, uh, government policies and emphasis change. And if you're all depending on one person knowing somebody, it may not suit you the best or it may not uh, be your best avenue. Okay, a little bit back to energy. Next slide, please. Okay, what are we talking about right now? Right now, three-fourths of China's energy comes from coal. We just wanted to uh, just stop this conversation right now and let's just do with what we have now. It would be, I would encourage anybody, any geniuses out there to find a, a, a quick and painless technology to work on clean or cleaner coal. I know there's some technologies out there and they're trying them, but still the elephant in the room is coal. Next slide, please. In the year 2020, this is what China predicts or the uh, statistics predict it will look like. Coal is still predominant, and with the rising and growing base of energy used in China, there will still be a lot of coal, a lot more than now. Uh, so that's, uh, I want you to remember that. But also look at the growth of the alternative energies. China's stimulus and policies are looking for some big additions to um, the energy mix or makeup in the year 2020. Now I'd like to introduce Scott Yao. Could we have the next slide, please? Thank you, Scott. Hello. Scott is our uh, commercial specialist who covers uh, conventional nuclear and wind energy, and he'll brief you a little bit on what he sees in the wind energy market. Yeah, thank you, Greg. Uh, hello, everyone. <clears throat> Just let me uh, spend a few minutes to go through the wind energy and the later on and the fire energy. Uh, as you know, China is uh, one of the largest countries in the world in terms of the uh, ge geographic area. So here we have abundant resource of wind power. According to a uh, Chinese authorities assessment made it a couple of years ago, we have totally about 3,226 gigawatts of the wind power resource. And among this, about 1,000 gigawatts uh, could be uh, commercialized. So based on this uh, assessment, the wind power is very likely to become the third 
a large source of energy in China. So just right after uh, thermal and uh, hydro power. Uh, in 2006, Chinese government issued the renewable energy law. Since then, China pushed for commercialization of wind power industry. Uh, Chinese wind power capacity has been growing rapidly since then, and starting from 2.6 gigawatts in 2006 to 12 gigawatts in 2008. So in the meantime, the manufacturing of localization of wind industry has been speeding up as well. Uh, as you can see, 50% of newly installed wind turbines were locally made uh, in 2007, and it reached about 74% in uh, 2008. Uh, however, uh, you know, because the uh, development of uh, uh, national grass uh, lags behind the wind power industry it demands, so only about 70% of uh, wind power was connected to the grid. So that's the uh, uh, bottleneck for the wind power industry in China. <coughs> Although, you know, as globalization uh, is uh, speed up, there are also some opportunities for the key components and the technologies for foreign companies. I will have this uh, later on. Uh, next, please. Here, I'll just give you some figures uh, to remind you the two major facts. One, uh, the import of the wind turbine is going down very quickly. And meanwhile, the export of the uh, wind turbine increasingly, uh, increase also uh, sharply. But the other fact is, you can see the wind turbine imported, um, the value of that is very huge. But the export, the unit of the export, the unit price of the export is very low. So that means China imports a high value and a big capacity wind turbine. And but the export, the wind turbine, which is very uh, low end and a small capacity. And since 2008, Chinese government just changed a little on the tariff policy for import, you can see here. Uh, any uh, wind turbine below 2.5 will not enjoy the tariff storage uh, policy. Next, please. Here, I want to highlight uh, for you that China, we have, in China, we have a uh, big five power producer, which is Hua Neng Da Tang. CPI. So this is the top five uh, power producers in China. They are total uh, power capacity accounted for about 44% of the national total capacity. So here you can see for, the, for each of them, the wind power capacity just counted a very, very small percent of their total capacity. And the Chinese government already uh, uh, announced a policy for each of the for each of the power producer, which is over five gigawatts. For them, they have to uh, increase its ownership of power generation from non hydro uh, renewable energy to be three uh, percent by 2010 and by and eight percent by 2020. So you can see there's a huge gap for each power producer to fill in the future for the wind power. Next, please. Yeah, uh, I also want to uh, highlight for you that we have now seven uh, uh, wind power basis projects we call uh, wind power three God projects. Uh, each wind power basis uh, capacity is over 10 gigawatts. So to reach the goal of 20, uh, 2020, uh, one gigawatt, 
the Chinese government just uh, set this long-term plan to construct a large, several large-scale wind, uh, wind power bases in Hebei, Gansu, Xinjiang, Jilin, Jiangsu, and Inner Mongolia. Uh, among these seven, the project in Gansu is currently under construction. And the other one I will highlight for you that in Shanghai we have an uh, offshore uh, wind farm, which is the first one I think in, in Asia. Next, please. Uh, what is the opportunity for the U.S. company? As I mentioned earlier, uh, although the localiz localization is speeding up, but still there are a lot of uh, opportunities for uh, U.S. company. Uh, as you might know, uh, in China we have about 80, U uh, 80 uh, wind, wind turbine manufacturers in China. So about 90% of them rely on import technologies, so they don't have in efficient uh, capability to uh, develop research on their own. So that means uh, they're also uh, looking for uh, some new technology and uh, new products. Uh, here the area they are looking for, like uh, wind turbine system design, uh, security policy design, bearings, remote monitoring, etc. And also, uh, the technology uh, for smart grids. However, there are also some challenges I just want to highlight too. First is the local content requirement. Any project developed in China, uh, there has to be 70% uh, of the local content. So that's a, a challenge for US or any foreign company. And also the challenge is any purchase under the similar package should be a domestic product. Okay, so um, now just let's go through the buy energy next. Okay, same as the wind power, in uh, China also has a boundary resource of bio uh, resources, uh, which is very diversified and uh, widely across the China. Here just uh, some figures uh, according to the Chinese uh, government. Uh, next, please. So you can see, uh, based on the uh, government uh, calculation, the target for uh, bioenergy output will increase very substantially between 2010 and 2020. Here, I just want to remind you, the Chinese government banned the uh, food, uh, ban the food-based uh, uh, feedstock for the use of the biofuel bio in 2007, starting promoting the non-food-based feedstock. Uh, feedstock. So that's the uh, uh, policy changing. <coughs> yeah. Lastly, I just give I want uh, highlight for some. Uh, Opportunities for the foreign company. Next, please. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, localization has been speed up, uh, but still China is uh, immature, and uh, there's also like some regulation for the biofuel in industry, and also they uh, have a. Uh, huge technology lag, uh, la uh, gaps to fill. So that means for the Chinese government, they are looking for some uh, uh, technology like the enzymatic to uh, produce the uh, biofuel from the agricultural residue and of course the residue. So that's the technology, for, example, for instance, the Chinese uh, government is eagerly uh, to uh, promote it and encouraged to encourage. Uh, yeah, okay, I just uh, uh, stop here and let Lisa to go through the uh, solar energy. Okay, yes, uh, thanks. So, um, and frankly, in East China, we see much less of uh, the officials talking to us about uh, biofuels than they do um, uh, solar.
solar and wind. Every place we go to, they want to have a solar and wind energy and put it into their energy mix. But we haven't heard that from biofuels, and we're thinking uh, that could be a geographic phenomenon that uh, other places in China may be better, and we could help you research that if you need it. Um, now I'd like to introduce Lisa Tong. She's the uh, high-tech specialist who covers the solar industry in China. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Lisa. Uh, as, as Greg mentioned, uh, solar as one of the uh, one of the most important renewable energy source is also very very hot in China these days. Uh, as you probably are aware, China is the uh, largest manufacturer of solar panels. Uh, in the year 2008, China manufactured two gigawatts uh, of uh, solar panels, uh, which is over 30 percent of the total world uh, capacity. Uh, and uh, China is continuing to grow the uh, production. So if you are in the solar business, you definitely need to uh, come to come to China. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. In the next slide, you will see a map of the uh, a map of China with the distribution of the solar panel panel manufacturers. You can see uh, apparently that there is a concentration on the east coast, especially in the uh, Yangtze Delta region, which is close to the city of Shanghai. The province of uh, of Jiangsu is uh, is uh, is a very high focus of the solar uh, manufacturers with a, with some big uh, companies like uh, SunTech, Trina, and China China Synergy. Uh, a lot of those companies are uh, started in China, but uh, went uh, IPO in overseas markets. In China now nowadays, there are altogether ten uh, solar companies that are listed in overseas markets. Uh, uh, therefore, uh, China is also subsidizing those companies to help to grow. Next slide, please. Uh, China issued two policies uh, this year in 2009 to promote the, lo the domestic solar market. As you probably uh, understand that China used to export most of the panels manufactured here, but the domestic market was very uh, was very small compared with like Europe or uh, U.S. But in starting this year, part of the, as part of the uh, uh, national stimulus economy stimulus plan, uh, China started to promote the domestic uh, solar market. And there are two policies in March and in July. Uh, you can uh, read the details on the slides. Uh, just very briefly, uh, these policies have are issued by the uh, have are uh, issued in combination with the Ministry of Finance, so there is money up, uh, already there to give to companies for solar projects. And uh, in order to uh, uh, enjoy the policy, you have to apply uh, with detailed projects and reserves the power to approve or disapprove that. Next, next slide, please. Um, and and um, with the rising China solar market, we uh, we encourage U.S. exporters to come to China with the, uh, the listed technology. As China is still the largest manufacturer, so we first encourage the companies that can supply equipment and materials used in the manufacturing. And uh, we especially encourage those high-end equipment and, and, and technology, because China is already trying to localize a lot of the low-end uh, equipment. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, if you are um, considering the China uh, solar, solar industry, uh, uh, whether you are already in the solar industry or you are trying to consider uh, uh, you are a, a traditional company, but are trying to consider entering the solar industry, uh, please let us know, and uh, we will try our best to help you. We had a, a, a webinar specifically on China's uh, PV industry in March this year. Uh, this is still available as a recorded version online. You can check the, uh, uh, you can download the PowerPoint, and we are planning another one uh, early next year. So please uh, uh, wait for that. 
that's the major point for the solar industry. I'll get back to Greg. Right. Okay, thank you, Lisa. And um, uh, there's one, I'm on the elephant theme today, but there's one sort of elephant in the room for uh, government organizations, and that's the National Development and Reform uh, Commission, who is in charge of a lot of policies on um, uh, pricing and approvals for uh, large projects in China. And, uh, I won't read all these, but there are several organizations you may want to um, uh, research and meet if you come to China. Next slide, please. There are lots of shows and seminars and symposiums in China and uh, almost to the point of uh, seminar fatigue. But um, these are some of the ones we've come across that may be um, suitable for you, but there's lots of others, uh, some really good, some okay. But if you, have a, if you find out about one and have specific questions, we may be able to uh, to see if well, we know who will be there and what will the topics be and things like that, um, just for your information. Next slide, please. We've gone over our time by quite a bit, but we did want to leave you one last uh, um, resource, and that's our contact information. Uh, I'm, I'm Greg. Uh, Scott, Lisa, and Andrew works with uh, Lisa on solar. Uh, for non-solar, you can start with uh, myself or Scott. Um, and again, FCS, we want to help you as firms uh, to export uh, technologies and uh, products to the China market. Um, FCS, the Foreign Commercial Service, also uh, participated in the China Green Tech Report and in initiative. It was a uh, public-private uh, foreign Chinese uh, group that just did some research and some brainstorming about the future of the green tech market, of which alternative energy was uh, uh, was one of the key components. So uh, they have an open source uh, executive summary online, free to everybody, and that's just another resource you can use. We thank you for your time. You know that's not a lot of time to talk about alternative energy or energy market in China. But we did just want to uh, give you some of the basic facts, uh, some of the big numbers that people talk about in China, uh, but also where we think you could really more actively participate uh, in this market. Great. Thank you very much, Greg. And thank you, Scott, and thank you, Lisa, for um, not only for your wealth of information, but also for your availability to do this a, a second time. Uh, we really appreciate that. And uh, for all of you that are watching this webinar, you have their contact information here on this screen. So if this presentation has led to any questions, please feel free to contact them uh, with uh, additional questions. Um, so we've finished with China, and we'll now uh, move uh, southeast to um, Thailand, where um, we are very uh, lucky to have a speaker from the Thai government, uh, Dr. Samai Chai-in who is the, uh, works with the Thailand House of Representatives uh, with the, uh, in the Energy Standing Committee. Uh, Dr. Jayin, uh, are you on the line? I'm online. Thank you. Yes. Great. Are, do you have the, the, the screen? Are you able to see the PowerPoint presentations on the screen? Yes, I can, I can see it uh, Perfect. pretty clearly. Very good. When, when, when you're finished with one slide, if you just let me know, I'll move it to the next slide. I'll do that. So we'll do a really fast one. Uh, Hello everyone. Uh, I'm going to be uh, presenting a brief overview of what is uh, being done uh, regarding the renewable energy in Thailand, and also I'll touch a little bit on on the significance of ASEAN because I know uh, our presentation will be covering China, which is uh, uh, an elephant, uh, like Craig just mentioned. So uh, the ASEAN countries somehow have to get together and to, to remain significant in the world market. Next slide, please. Uh, next, please. When you look at ASEAN altogether, we have uh, we are now approaching 600 million population, and uh, 
the collective GDP is 1.5 trillion US. So we are uh, quite way above India in terms of collective GDP, but we are somewhat uh, uh, one third of China and uh, one perhaps one fourth of uh, Japan in that regard. But it is growing fast. And uh, in six years' time, all the ASEAN economies will come together under one roof. So, so this is something you have to bear in mind. Next, please. And when you look at uh, the major ASEAN five economies, that is Thailand, Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, and Singapore, we are all uh, fossil dependent. Uh, everyone is uh, a net importer of uh, fossil fuel except Malaysia, of course, to export to. Next slide. And uh, this has become one of the major reasons why we are developing our bioenergy as part of uh, the renewable energy push in the past decade. Uh, you can see the, in this slide the collective import of uh, uh, crude oil. Uh, last year it hit uh, 3.7 million barrels a day in ASEAN. The, the largest one, of course, is uh, Indonesia. Is Indonesia. Second is uh, Singapore. Most of them is for re-export, of course, and then Thailand. Next case. On this slide, I show you some uh, history of the power sector. Uh, it was pretty badly hit during the financial crisis 10 years ago. And now we, are, we expect that uh, this time round, the crisis taking place in Europe and uh, North America should last perhaps about one or two years. So by, by the third quarter of next year, we should see some growth, uh, some picking up in the power sector in, in ASEAN. Next slide. And this is the uh, broad overview of what is being done in the ASEAN economies in terms of uh, biofuel development opportunities. Uh, all countries uh, uh, have put in some pretty good concrete plans in terms of the adoption of uh, all form of alternative energy. In this graph alone, it's, I only depict the development plan for biodiesel and ethanol. Next slide. Of course, the, the, the one to come up uh, very strongly in this regard is uh, Thailand. But we have to overcome some of this debate like uh, the uh, food and fuel crisis, the uh, land and water scarcity is issues, the human security issues. And of course, some people even blame uh, some of our neighbors for uh, turning some of the farmland into uh, energy crop that it will be harmful to sustainable development or be harmful to food production. But I think uh, for now, we have to focus on the uh, policy for uh, uh, rural job creation because uh, this is something the government or all government need to address. Next slide. You can see uh, in this uh, uh, regard, Thailand has 20 million hectares of uh, arable land. Half of that is for rice paddy. And for rice in, 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 in this region, we only most of them are a year, uh, can do it in once in a year. That means we put the land to work only four months in 12 months for the rest, of course. The farmer has to seek other jobs, and that is not very really easy to, to do. Uh, that makes the productivity of our agro sector uh, very low. Next case. Of course, some people have blamed that on the uh, social uh, uh, inequality in, in Southeast Asia in general. In this picture on the left hand graph, you can see the red bits are the rain set, rice paddy. And the right hand graph, the red uh, color, represent the second or third crop of rice, meaning they are uh, irrigated land for, for rice paddy. Uh, those uh, on the right hand side have very high productivity, but uh, you can see on the left hand side there. Uh, uh, eight months, the land are not being put to good use, uh, meaning just, just leave it to dry under the, the uh, hot tropical sun. So we are trying to do something about it. Next step. And uh, of course, uh, this is the graph showing the 
uh, productivity of the land in square meter uh, per year. Uh, same topic is of course Malaysia where they have a lot of uh, food practice in terms of uh, palm oil and rubber plantation. Most of them are part of the large agro industry chain. The bottom guy of course is Thailand and we are looking to to solve this. <coughs> Next week. And this is the economy of Thailand in the uh, in 2008. We are number one exporter of several com commodities like uh, rice, rubber, uh, cassava. Uh, for as for sugarcane, we are number second, second only to Brazil in terms of export. And also, uh, all time we are the third producer in the world, and it is climbing up pretty fast. And this is the part of the major pillar of uh, renewable energy development in Thailand. Next. Week. And this is the average for energy crop. Uh, the top two, about one million hectare plantation is the uh, sugarcane and cassava, which, which is, which are now the feedstock for our bioethanol program. And the bottom one, <coughs> the, the green one, the green graph, represents the average for all palm, which is rising pretty fast. Next. Year. And this is the farm gate income. So all of these are a billion plus uh, commodity a year, which is quite significant for our agro sector in Thailand. Next year. <coughs> and uh, one more reason that we need to adopt or adapt our social uh, workforce very really fast is that uh, Thailand is moving into what we call the end aging society. By 2025, Thailand will be in an aging uh, population country, similar to Japan and, and Germany now, but uh, the gap between Thailand and Germany or Japan is, I would say, much longer than the window of opportunity that we have. So we need to adapt that very fast. And of course, agri industry is a major key in that uh, attempt. Next year. Bioenergy in Thailand has uh, taken root from uh, His Majesty the King's effort uh, since 1985, uh, both ethanol and biodiesel. So we even have uh, a, a royal project in the palace uh, demonstrating some uh, technology for, for this, to convert molasses, to convert cassava into ethanol, and to convert uh, used cooking oil and palm oil into biodiesel, which has been running for the past decade in the, the Grand Palace, next week. And as a result of that, as a result of that inspiration, we uh, have a, uh, set up a long-term plan that by 2030, Thailand will somewhat turn our agricultural industry into what we call a carbohydrate economy. We will not keep on exporting cheap commodity to the world market anymore. We will try to make do with what we have, convert it at source, create rural jobs, and of course, in, in that process, we hope to be able to turn uh, our uh, economy around into a better shape. Next slide. Uh, so since uh, we look at this in, to, in the late 1990s and uh, uh, in 2003, we look at it and have a plan. And then last year, we revised that plan, put it 15 years forward. Uh, <coughs> As of last year, 5% of total energy consumption in Thailand is renewable energy or alternative energy. By 2022, we hope to make it 20.4%. Of course, we try to meet the 20 by 20 agenda. And we have put in a lot of uh, uh, programs, incentives, and uh, uh, government support. We have, we have given full uh, uh, investment support to all forms of alternative energy development in, in electricity, in heat generation, in biofuel, and even in natural gas for transportation sector. Uh, this is a very ambitious plan. We are, uh, as, uh, by the end of this year, 2009, we should be able to make it more than 6.5% share. So this is a, a quite a, a good plan to put in place. Uh, by 2020, we expect that we can save the 
reduce the import of fossil fuel by 12 billion US dollars a year. And we can generate, uh, uh, we will need investment, something like 10 billion US dollars a year by that time. So, so, so the, the saving in the fuel import, we need the investment requirement. So in, in effect, this uh, will accrue to the uh, capital stock of the country. Next please. Uh, this is the detail of uh, the transportation sector, uh, where we will try to reduce the dependency on fossil fuel uh, on diesel from 66% last year to 45% by 2022. Uh, gasoline from 28% to 16%. We developed gas for transportation from 3% today to 20% uh, in, in 15 years' time. And uh, biofuel from 3.5% today to 14% by 2022. At that 3% level, Thailand is now the leading country in Asia who has adopted biofuel in the transportation sector. Next slide. Uh, this is the <coughs> Thailand has mandated E2 in the, in, in the country since last year. And this is the gasoline consumption. Uh, of course, more than half of those gasoline are now in gasoline form, meaning we blend ethanol into it. And we, Thailand has also adopted the uh, EFI flex fuel model, which is uh, putting uh, two manufacturers are now producing uh, flex fuel models in, in the country to uh, to be able to support uh, the government plan to to uh, to happen the development of a uh, uh, new alternative energy. Next case. Next slide. So the critical component of uh, this uh, uh, attempt or this policy uh, in Thailand is that we need to diversify our agricultural, uh, agricultural sector from food and feed export market into what we call the energy and fiber market. Uh, in the past 10 years, we have put in a lot of te te technology and industrial infrastructure. And uh, of course, we stay with the political decision that we have made in the past two In the past uh, several administrations, uh, there are some barriers that we need to, uh, to, to, to overcome, of course, like the consumer perception, like the sustainability issues and uh, uh, so this year we can say that uh, Thailand is now the top five bioethanol producer, and uh, as for biodiesel, we are top ten in the world. And that's not bad for for a program that has been in place about ten years time. Next slide. Uh, this is uh, I'm going to cover very quickly the resources that we have to for this bioenergy program. This is the sugar production. Thailand export more than uh, three quarters of uh, the sugar production, so we want to reduce that. Next thing. And this is the cassava, which is another uh, potential feedstock for ethanol program. Today, Thailand has 15 uh, ethanol uh, plants, and uh, 12 of them is uh, on uh, using molasses, which is a byproduct from, cassava, uh, from sugar cane three plants and are using cassava in this picture. We are the world, world number one in terms of productivity and number one in terms of export, but we are the third producer in the world behind uh, uh, Nigeria. Next is uh, Of course, uh, Thailand is now controlling 81% of the cassava or tapioca in terms of starch. Uh, export in the world, and uh, in the future, it will be interesting to see the impact of that. Next slide. It might actually mean that uh, there will be more uh, export market for for corn starch, for example. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is the uh, ethanol fuel project all over the country. Most of them are concentrated in the eastern part of the country, or not eastern part. Next slide. Next slide. 
and uh, this is the future plan. So by 2011, we will have a, a, a very strong sector for uh, ethanol in our gasoline market, and of course for biodiesel, we will aim to mandate B5 by 2011, and uh, B10 will be given some uh, tax incentive uh, as an option for the consumer. Next slide. And uh, some people will ask, uh, how could Thailand uh, grow more uh, bioenergy crops? Uh, in fact, this is not a problem. We have a pretty good uh, 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 tropical uh, climate, and you can see in this picture, we are in the same belt as uh, uh, Nigeria, in the same belt as uh, uh, the central or, or southern uh, America, American country. So we should be able to, to do that in a pretty good way. Next slide. And this is, of course, the palm oil assay expansion plan. Next slide. It's about, about one million acres for the next uh, three years. And by 2012, about half of the palm oil production in Thailand will go for bio energy uh, or oil or chemical feed. The other half will be for uh, the other half will be for food sector uh, and the export sector. Next slide. And this is uh, an example of what we have been able to do in terms of converting uh, the uh, idle land in the northern part of uh, Bangkok and use that to grow oil palm, which is has a very high yield. Next slide. And in, in a sense, we can uh, solve what we call the acidic soil problem. And this is uh, one of the good examples. I'll go to the last slide. Uh, I don't think we have time to cover all these uh, issues, but uh, I would like to uh, uh, say that uh, the way forward for, for Thailand is that uh, there are still a lot of challenges. There's still a lot of barriers in terms of the export and import and other things. But we are now putting in a pretty good plan. And we are not only talking about Thailand at the moment, we are looking to uh, mobilize the whole the ASEAN economy to to come into this uh, uh, diversification program of our uh, agricultural uh, commodity. And uh, uh, there is a huge opportunity for investment. In Thailand, we need about 10 billion a year in terms of investment. And uh, I expect that the total housing market will be three or four times that. Uh, I'm speaking on behalf of, of course, Malaysia and Indonesia, which is very strong in terms of our palm oil. We are uh, seeking new opportunity, investment opportunity for other ASEAN countries in uh, Cambodia, Laos, and Myanmar, which is uh, even when uh, we can uh, engage them in the uh, in this uh, new investment opportunity, it will be good because that will solve a lot of uh, rural job problems that we have. Uh, I will close with that. Uh, I would say that uh, Thailand is now pretty well prepare to uh, to to join the uh, leaders in in bioenergy and renewable energy sector in the world i di i don't have time to cover all other issues like uh, solar which is a very strong sector in thailand as well uh, hydro and <clears throat> of course we are now putting in something like 2000 megawatts of uh, wind farm all over the country and uh, there are other issues i'll be happy to uh, follow up on email Questions if you should have any uh, inquiries afterward. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Doctor. Really appreciate your time. Uh, one real quick question for you. You've talked a lot about the bioenergy sector and um, all of the opportunities with regard to um, you know agriculture. Um, are there specific opportunities beyond investment for U.S. Uh, companies in this bioenergy sector, possibly for uh, equipment or, or something of that nature? Of course, uh, there's a lot of, uh, uh, <clears throat> I know the, the U.S. has a very strong automotive sector. Well, uh, at least in terms of the technology we have. And that is uh, some, some, something that I hope uh, the big uh, three in the American motors, uh, auto sector will come in and uh, do something about it in, in, in the Thai market. And of course, not only Thai market, in ASEAN, so in auto parts. 
and also in terms of the high technology, the second generation biofuel uh, or SO, or even battery. At the moment, we have a lot of interest in the electricity and hybrid units. I think battery will be some of the issue that uh, uh, technology company in the U.S. can come in and uh, uh, see what we uh, can do in, in terms of the Thai market or, or the Asian market as such. Great. Thank you again, um, Doctor. I really appreciate your time and your uh, availability to do this um, just one week after our uh, original um, event. So thank you very much. Thank you. Good. Welcome uh, uh, to, to talk to you again. Great. Um, Alan, Alan, are you on the line? Yes, I'm on the line. Perfect, Alan. Um, are you going to be using the, the presentation that we had from the speaker last week? Yeah, exactly. Okay. It should be on. Do you see it on your screen? Yep. Okay, perfect. Why don't you uh, go ahead and get started. Alan is uh, the commercial specialist in Taipei for the commercial service, and um, he handles the energy sector, among others. And uh, so Alan will, will be talking now about uh, green energy opportunities and industry in, in Taiwan. So, uh, Alan, uh, just like with the other speakers, when you're ready for the slide to go to the next one, just say next slide. Okay. Uh, hi everyone, this is Alan Chen from U.S. Commercial Service Taipei. Uh, today I'm glad to have this opportunity to share some opinions about uh, Taiwan's opportunities on uh, green energy. And actually today we will follow the PowerPoint uh, materials prepared by Dr. Yang Zixing. Uh, Dr. Yang Zixing is uh, the Deputy uh, Director of uh, DITRI's uh, uh, Green Energy Office. ITRI is, uh, I mean, that uh, Industrial Technology Research Institute, which is an uh, institute totally sponsored by Taiwan's MOEA. MOEA is, uh, is the Ministry of uh, Economic Affairs. So in this PowerPoint, uh, some of the Taiwan government policies uh, and the goals will be uh, 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 conveyed uh, during the, the power presentation. Next slide, please. And in this PowerPoint, basically, we will cover three uh, topics. One, we will talk about the uh, governmental policy on Taiwan's green energy industry. And uh, basically, uh, secondly, we will share some opinions about the best prospects in Taiwan, which will be photovoltaic, LED, wind, and electrical vehicles. And finally, we will do some kind of uh, conclusions for the reference of uh, U.S. companies that expect to export your service or products to Taiwan. Next, please. Uh, as compared to the mainland uh, main China, everybody knows actually Taiwan's market is quite uh, small, actually. But uh, most of the time, um, all, all the foreigners right now, including the U.S. companies, they will have a perspective called the Greater China Area. The Greater China Area will include, of course, mainland China and also Hong Kong, Macau, and finally Taiwan. Taiwan, even though uh, our domestic market is not so big, however, Taiwan has been playing a very important key role in the manufacturing base in the world. Essentially, we have a very excellent uh, success in the ICT industry. Everybody knows that maybe most of the world uh, uh, desktop computers and notebook computers and even mobile phones are manufactured either in Taiwan or in the mainland China plants operated by Taiwan companies. So, so uh, sometimes when we, when we are talking about some sectors in Taiwan, usually we will highly recommend the U.S. companies take a broader view, uh, thinking about Taiwan's advantage if you have a strong interest to export your product and service to the great China area. So in Taiwan, about the green energy sector, actually, Taiwan has set a very clear goal about a sustainable energy policy, which includes a CO2 emission reduction, low carbon energy power generation, and then recently, the Taiwan government has just raised the so-called Sunrise Program that will promote even further about Taiwan's green energy development. And finally, just uh, the past June, we have uh, Taiwan has just passed uh, an act called the Renewable Energy Development Act. In this act, the government is totally authorized to provide some subsidiaries to promote any kind of renewable energy, which includes solar, 
uh, include the wind, include the biomass, and so on. Right now, the Taiwan government is negotiating closely with the industry to decide the subsidiary uh, amount to further promote the development of Taiwan's uh, renewable energy sector. Next, please. And uh, uh, Taiwan, actually, we have uh, a very clear goal. Basically, we will cover three central goals to develop in Taiwan as Taiwan's sustainable energy development policy. First of all, we will focus on efficiency because uh, uh, in Taiwan, uh, we have uh, many quite mature industries. For example, petrochemical, for, uh, for example, textile, for example, food production. Uh, all these uh, sectors, they use a lot of energy, and some of their equipment has some, uh, has some basis to improve their efficiency. For example, uh, most of the, the companies in the petrochemical industry, they use a lot of uh, boilers in their process. So lots of uh, efforts will be used to increase the efficiency, to be uh, the, the efficiency uh, for this equipment in different uh, mature sectors. Secondly, uh, Taiwan will have a goal to increase the cleanliness. So we have some kind of, uh, just as I mentioned in a previous slide, we have a clear goal to reduce the CO2 emission. And we also uh, try to find some kind of alternative, for example, the IPCC, uh, integrated gasification combined cycle, a method to, to be used by Taiwan's major utilities for power generation. Uh, uh, lastly, because Taiwan will rely maybe more than 98% on the import of foreign energy sources. So recently, uh, we, we also will uh, focus on the stability of uh, Taiwan's uh, 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 energy supply. So recently, even though we have already four nuclear power plants in Taiwan, and uh, 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 right now the government thinks maybe we have to extend some uh, nuclear power points to be still used uh, uh, to maintain Taiwan's uh, stability of, uh, of energy supply. Next, please. Okay, this is talking about uh, energy efficiency or about uh, the energy con con conservation target. As you can see in this slide, every year the government has set a 2% increase to, to, to help the, the whole industry to increase their equipment efficiency on energy savings. Next, please. Okay, uh, this is uh, uh, because a lot of uh, sectors are related to the energy. So in Taiwan, basically, we focus on four different approaches. One is about the industry and energy sectors. The other one is, of course, transportation sector. And the last one is the residential and the government sectors. So for each different sector, uh, uh, Taiwan government has uh, already set very precise goal for them to do the for them to pursue in the uh, to do the energy conservation at their goal in the future. Next please. Uh, this slide shows uh, uh, a, a total, for uh, example, like, like an action plan because we have a vision just as. Uh, I already mentioned in previous slides, because in Taiwan we have a vision to create an energy saving society and a low carbon economy. So of course, we have to develop some kind of action plan. So in this slide, you can see that the Taiwan government has already selected two industries as the pillar industry. One is the photovoltaic, the other one is the LED lighting. In addition to that, we also identified five potential industries which include the wind, electrical vehicle, EICT, biomass, hydrogen, and the fuel cell as uh, another five potential industries. So in the future, uh, the two pillar industries and the, these five potential industries will be targeted by Taiwan as the goal to help Taiwan to achieve its, uh, 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 Taiwan's vision on energy saving society and the low carbon economy. Next, please. So this is a, a strategy plan. So uh, uh, once Taiwan has uh, uh, located the two pillar industries and the five additional industries to be, to be the targeted, 
for, for future promotion. So first of all, we have to identify what's the industrial competitiveness in Taiwan. As I already mentioned, Taiwan's market is too small. So usually, and uh, the, uh, the Taiwan, Taiwan companies, Taiwan government usually has a very um, established philosophy that we would like to identify, first of all, what kind of chances the Taiwan companies they already have, and what kind of a collaboration pattern or cooperation methods that we can develop to cooperate with the foreign suppliers and foreign vendors and to work together for a common target, a market target. So this slide shows that basically we have to identify our industrial competitiveness and through the cooperation with foreign suppliers and foreign vendors, we can identify a common target. For example, we can identify the greater China as the whole market, and we can the USA companies and can take advantage of Taiwan's uh, already have uh, 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 a sentiment to 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 enter this potential target. Next, please. Okay. So you can see that in this slide, because ICT is Taiwan's most successful industry, and based on the, the umbrella of the whole ICT, Taiwan has established a very well-established manufacturing base for any kind of related of uh, technology or related of uh, components. So in this slide, we put the ICT in the center of this uh, action plan, and we put uh, PV for the voltaic and LED lighting and other potential industries. And we put them together trying to enhance the strengths we already have and trying to gather some other uh, uh, resources from foreign companies and to work together to cultivate a common market on green energy industry. Next, please. Okay, so for the, the, the major industry I already identified in this slide, including solar, PV, LED, wind, and electric vehicles, we do have some kind of uh, dollar value board to be pursued in the following years. Next, please. And uh, you can see this is for the, for the solar photovoltaic. For the, for uh, Taiwan, actually, right now, we have, we have been the number, number four largest. Uh, a power seller manufacturer in the world. And you can see from this slide, actually, the government and the industry uh, have set a very aggressive floor, aggressive floor for us to, uh, to pursue in the following years. Next, please. And this slide shows something uh, I think it would be very uh, 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 valuable for the difference with U.S. companies. Everybody knows that in the industry of solar power, actually there is a very long supply chain. Even though right now Taiwan is the number four uh, uh, largest manufacturer of solar seller, but uh, for the raw material, for example, the ingot and the wafer, and for the downstream uh, areas such as the module and the uh, heating systems, we still have uh, we still do not have uh, lots of uh, established uh, manufacturing capabilities. And even for the, uh, the manufacturing of a power seller, power seller, usually the Taiwanese companies, they import the equipment that I find the prior uh, uh, from the, the, the European companies, Japanese companies, and from the USA companies. So uh, Taiwan has already put a PV solar industry as one of the pillar industry of their summarized program. And uh, you can see in the whole supply chain, of the power solar manufacturing, including the, the very downstream of uh, uh, application systems, the U.S. companies can find the opportunity to sell Taiwan either the very upstream raw material or some kind of key components for the Taiwanese company to be used in, in the assembly of the module and the application system. And even they can sell lots of uh, good equipment to be Taiwanese company for them to manufacture a uh, solar cell. Next, please. Okay, this slide also show our show Taiwan's uh, 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 solar industry development strategy. So you can see that in the central, uh, we, we put a powerful system integration plan 
So uh, Taiwanese, we already know that most of Taiwanese companies in the solar power, uh, solar power industry, their strength is manufacturing. Their strength is mass production. However, they need the upstream the raw material. They need the equipment to be used, and they need some kind of uh, market market uh, 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 development ability. So all these things can be used by USA companies. If you are going to sell raw materials to Taiwan, if you are going to sell um, manufacturing equipment to Taiwan, and you are going to find some kind of uh, uh, partner of a solar system, I think you can think of Taiwan as your first uh, consideration uh, to, to, to develop your international business. Next, please. Okay. This will put the four areas. Uh, uh, I mentioned that uh, if you are a USA company, if you really think uh, you can find some partners in Taiwan, and uh, you can identify even more. For example, if your uh, business category is about uh, the C-based solar cell or C-based thin film, or your 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 company's chance is in in seed ingots or wafer or PV modules, all these three or four areas. You can find the potential to work with Taiwanese companies. Next, please. Uh, uh, just as uh, the solar cell uh, industry, the other key uh, industry is called LED. Actually, the Taiwan philosophy, Taiwan government philosophy, is quite simple. Because, as I mentioned before, the Taiwan has been very successful in the manufacturing of ICT industry, and we are very successful. In the in the fabric uh, uh, plant uh, to to manufacture lots of uh, different kinds of uh, semiconductors, so the solar cell and, and uh, ED, these two industries are quite related to the semiconductor uh, semiconductor industries. So that's the reason why the Taiwan uh, Taiwan government and the industry they they selected the solar cell, the solar power, and uh, ED as the two key uh, industries in the green industry. So this is uh, this slide talking about Taiwan's uh, uh, goal about how to develop LED lighting in the near future. Just recently, uh, because right now uh, uh, the Taiwan Taiwan uh, the situation, the relationship between Taiwan and the mainland China is getting better and better. So sometimes, uh, especially sometimes, the China government they will give uh, a special opportunity. For Taiwanese companies to export their product to mainland China, for example, recently uh, the, 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 after the coordination of the China's government, they they already uh, coordinated uh, more than more than um, uh, uh, dozens of cities that they are going to use the LED lighting system manufactured by Taiwan. However, in Taiwan, the strength is only on the uh, we we only have the chance. To manufacture the LED, um, LED itself. However, to offer, uh, to produce the LED lighting system, we still need lots of uh, other vendors and suppliers' uh, support. Next slide, please. So you can see that on the left hand side, left the side, left left hand side, we listed some, uh, we we list some. Uh, uh, Weakness, actually, if I can use the word. Uh, however, Taiwan's weakness will be the, the, the opportunities for USA companies. For example, we do not, we still do not have uh, uh, a very stable supply of the upstream material, and we are quite uh, short on component manufacturing technology, and we are quite weak on, on the on the system product development, and uh, finally, it's very hard for the Chinese companies. To, to find the market entrance path, and also uh, we are quite uh, distinct on future needs. So these kind of weakness for Chinese companies will be the opportunity for USA companies. So US companies, you will think this this few items is your chances. Then you can take advantage of Taiwanese companies, which are shown on the right hand side. For example, we have a very superior on um, um, mass production. Of this kind of LED uh, key, uh, key uh, 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 LED itself, and we also quite flexible on um, business operation, and we can provide timely response to market needs. 
And finally, uh, this is a very popular for capital investors. So for the USA company, if you have an interest to incorporate the LED as one kind of a component in your final system, I think the target companies will, will be your best partner uh, to, to, to manufacture the final product for your company. Next, please. Uh, talking about, after talking about uh, the two pillar industries, uh, solar power and LED, right now we, we go through very quickly about the wind, wind power opportunity in Taiwan. As I already mentioned, Taiwan is a small island. We do not have, uh, uh, Taiwan itself is not a very big market. However, uh, uh, Taiwan has started its uh, wind power generation project maybe about since uh, five years ago. Actually, the Taiwan Power Company, the only utility in Taiwan, has installed lots of uh, wind turbines along the island. Uh, but for the USA company, I think uh, if your company is uh, uh, specialized in the so-called offshore, offshore power, uh, wind power system, you can find some opportunity in the, in the near future. Because you can see that uh, uh, between mainland China and Taiwan, there's the Taiwan Strait, okay, Taiwan Strait. And uh, uh, in, in the Taiwan Strait, the sea water level is quite shallow. So it's easy if, uh, for, 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 uh, for us to build some kind of offshore wind farm in the Taiwan Strait and just uh, connect the, the wind farm to the Taiwan Island. So if your company is specialized, in this uh, offshore, offshore uh, wind power generation, I think you can find still find uh, uh, some opportunities in Taiwan, and uh, we are uh, very glad to introduce you to the Taiwan Power Company to 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 uh, make any kind of uh, uh, successful uh, business transaction for your company. Next, please. Okay. Uh, this is a, this slide also mentions some kind of a target strategy about the Taiwan wind power development. So you can see, that they, uh, of course, we target some kind of a research and development. We talk about something about the the industry, for example, because most of the key components right now are still imported from far east supplier. But uh, we hope the Taiwanese companies they can provide some kind of a maintenance service after the adoption, uh, adoption, adoption of this uh, wind farm. And we also hope we can join some kind of a standard, a standard preparation and a standard writing in the world. Of course, uh, if uh, you're the company, you can find the Taiwanese company as your partner. Uh, the Taiwanese companies are more than happy to be your manufacturing base in Asia. And also we can uh, target uh, uh, any kind of potential markets in the mainland China area and also the Southeastern Asia area. Next, please. Okay, finally, we're talking about something about the electrical vehicles. Actually, uh, for the time being, uh, Taiwan has some time, because just like uh, Alex I mentioned before, uh, Taiwan is quite successful in, in ICT, and everybody knows uh, a, a notebook or, or a mobile phone, they need lots of uh, batteries. So some kind of uh, some Chinese companies specialized in the manufacture of batteries have uh, already devoted their efforts for the batteries to be used by any kind of electrical vehicles. But for the auto automobile, maybe it's much more challenging for Chinese companies. But right now we are quite successful to provide uh, 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 batteries to be used by motorcycles and some kind of very like a bicycle to be used uh, in, in, in the sports industry. Next, please. So right now I'm going to offer some kind of conclusions for the reference to U.S. companies. As I, as I mentioned before, Taiwan itself is not a very big market. However, Taiwan has uh, such a wonderful location, uh, just uh, very near to the uh, main channel. And right now, the, the relationship between Taiwan and mainland China is getting better and better. And Taiwan has been very successful in the industry of ICT and the semiconductor. So uh, identifying the Taiwanese transit, the Taiwanese government and the industry has already selected the solar PV 
and LED as two of the key industries to be developed uh, uh, in the uh, green, green energy industry. So any U.S. company, uh, if you have any kind of uh, equipment, any kind of uh, technology, any kind of a uh, service, and you are, your main target is in the in the Greater China area or Southeast Asia country, you can really pick Taiwan as your best partner, even a manufacturing partner or a marketing partner, because of Taiwan we really have a very uh, unique and a special location and a very uh, special um, uh, position in the manufacturing supply chain around the world. So this is, uh, uh, we use a very uh, limited time to offer you some kind of very limited information for your reference if you have an interest to enter uh, Asia, uh, Asia uh, market. So if you have any questions, you can contact me directly. We are more than happy to bring you and, and offer you any kind of uh, counseling opinion and any kind of uh, research results for your reference. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Alan. Uh, thanks again uh, to you and to our speakers from China and from Thailand for uh, being available um, on very short notice to do this rebroadcast of our um, uh, for a second half of our uh, renewable energy webinar. And um, uh, for all of you listeners and viewers uh, on this webinar, the contact information for Alan, for our energy specialist in Thailand, and our energy specialist in China will be included on the email that I sent to you as well as Singapore. Unfortunately, our speaker for Singapore was unavailable to join us today, but uh, we will include the contact information for, for our specialist in Singapore. So if uh, today's uh, webinar has led to any uh, additional questions that you may have, please feel free to contact any of them um, uh, with, with your questions, and they'll be sure to get back to you. Uh, so once again, I want to appreciate uh, all of the speakers. I want to thank all the speakers, and I, and I want to thank all of the uh, viewers for your patience with us, and I hope you find this useful. And if, uh, if it leads to any questions, please uh, contact, uh, contact us and let us know how we can help you uh, with your uh, international efforts. Uh, with that, I think we will conclude. Uh, thanks again, and um, uh, good luck exporting. Goodbye. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks. Hello? Hello? Yes. บอกว่าโอเคขอจบแค่นี้แล้วโอเคก็ขอขอบคุณที่เสียเวลาฟังเราแล้วก็